Uh, we have a, I would say we have a very specific product shelf. Um, our primary product is universal life. Um, so we really, uh, most of our sales are in universal life. We do sell term, uh, and we do sell through one of our, uh, through one of our, um, uh, channels, a Siggy product. So a simplified issue and guaranteed issue product as well. Um, and just with respect to kind of, uh, this conversation, we're at a point where, uh, currently, more than 95% of our applications are via eApp. Uh, so we've done a very, uh, we've been very successful with regards to implementing technology. And we're also at 100% e-delivery of all of our policies. Um, now, that is, a I can attribute that to COVID to really push that to, to 100%. But uh, yeah, so we've, we've been very lucky um, from a technology implementation, pushing innovation forward. Um, and of course, I have to say that we just launched uh, our new e app with uh, Sapiens last week. So, uh, so which has uh, been uh, very successful so far. Great, congratulations on that. Thank you. <laughs> um, John Sadinsky, would you like to introduce yourself? Thanks so much, Scott. Yep, sure. Um, <clears throat> I'm John Sadinsky. Uh, basically, my career was in, <clears throat> was in life underwriting. Uh, was in life underwriting for 45 years. I retired about a year and a half ago and enjoyed it for a while and uh, got a little bored, so I joined Sapiens as a consultant. Um, but in my career, I was chief underwriter for several companies. The uh, latest company was Erie, where I was involved heavily in the implementation of Underwriting Pro. Um, <clears throat> and in my career, I could say I've probably dealt with just about every type of distribution source that's out there and probably just about every type of product. Um, so just had a very had a very uh, enlightening career. Um, I guess the one thing that I'm probably the most proud of was uh, back in 1979. I got I got knew some people who brought me into a company that was a startup operation, which is kind of an odd thing to do. Life insurance company back then, but the company was first Penn Pacific, and um, I remained there for 23 years. Was a chief underwriter, but. What was nice about that was I, I got involved in so many things. I had to basically design the underwriting new business process and the systems, got to work with the systems people and helping build the system. Um, and we were, the reason the company was started back then is we were the, uh, basically the second company in the industry to come out with Universal Life. And the company was started as a Universal Life only company. Uh, and we remained a Universal Life only company till the mid nineties when we started coming out with some other products. But it was a great experience, and I, I just learned so much uh, that a typical underwriter would not be involved in. So that's about it. Great, great. Thanks, John. Um, and I obviously would like to now uh, welcome uh, my co-host, Nancy Kasparov, Vice President of Research and Consulting at Novarica. Thanks, Nancy, for doing this with us and doing this with me. Um, sure. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself and the work that you do at Novarica? Sure. So I'm Nancy Casparo. I am a vice president of research and consulting at Novarica, and I've been there for um, about two years, actually two years almost to the day. Um, <clears throat> prior to that, I was in in the industry. Um, so for for many years, so for over thirty years, starting in insurance and then some banking, um, and then I moved to MetLife, which might be a name that some people know in the insurance industry. And I was there for um, I like to say forever. Um, I pretty much grew up there, so I was there for 29 years before retiring. Um, what it's really, what it really gave me is a good perspective um, on the business of insurance, but also from a whole financial um, services perspective, from banking to property and casualty to life insurance, just understanding the differences across the business, the different drivers, and of course the difference that that actually made in technology and how technology is applied. And um, we'll talk a little bit about that too. So great to be here. Great. And so you prepared uh, some research material for us to walk through, uh, or you're going to walk us through. And then I think we're going to open up the panel to some questions from you know, <clears throat> that we have, as well as uh, I imagine some of the folks who are uh, part of the webinar. We want to encourage them to raise their hand or put some questions in uh, the chat, and we'll get to those. But <clears throat> let's, uh, let's see a little bit more about what's going on right. from your research. Sure. So I did put some um, some slides together that we'll talk through. It's really just to set the stage and kind of give the tone for innovation in, in the um, insurance world, something we've been talking about for a while. So just a little bit about Novarica and how we get all the information that we have. So we concentrate on 
um, you know, research and consulting services within the insurance and particularly the IT part of insurance in North America. Uh, North America, really, from our perspective, is U.S. and Canada, um, nothing against Mexico, but it's a very different market, very different technology, um, and obviously different language as well. So it's a really a different market, and that's so we, we concentrate on the U.S. and Canada. Um, we have, I'm going to kind of amend it, we have over 150 insurers that um, we are working with now. So we actually changed uh, that because our numbers really increased this year. Um, we sort of at all, when we say insurance, it's really all lines of business, excluding the um, like major medical and health. It's also a very consolidated and different business. We have some names that are on the screen of some, some clients that we, that we work with, so some big names. We have large carriers, small carriers. But in addition to the, those that are actually our clients, we have a research council, which is over 300 insurer CIO members. And it is from that group that are in the industry and living it every day that we get our information and obviously we share information with them as well. So we really try to keep our finger on the pulse of what's happening, what the trends are, um, what folks are actually spending their money on from an IT perspective, um, how innovation is, is progressing. So it's, it's a great community that shares a lot of information and really gives us some great information for our research. So we can go forward. And can go forward again. So uh, every year we do research on budgets and projects. So we look to see what are carriers actually spending their IT dollars on? Because IT dollars are precious, right? And there's always more demand than there is supply and funding and resources. So when we start talking about innovation and how you work innovation into that, you cannot help but go to the word of digital, right? Digital just becomes something we're all talking about. Um, it's almost become a buzzword and it really should be more than that because it really is all about the customer experience, the ability to serve your customer with speed and agility. And how do you really meet them where they want to be as opposed to us developing things and just expecting them to do business the way that we want them to and to buy the products that we think we've manufactured for years and years and they should buy. So it's really shifting that dynamic. And when you talk about um, IT dollars, there's really three things that you want to do, right? There's three levers of value in that. You either want to sell more by investing in it, and there's some information there on how, you know, how do you do that? Do you, you know, how do you drive the transactions, drive the sales? How do you provide information? Because I don't know of anybody today that actually goes and buys anything without researching it um, first from the comfort of their home, especially in today's world. But now they've actually taken it to a whole different where they want to do the entire transaction from home um, by themselves or assisted, but with nobody in their home. So it's a different dynamic that's been happening. The other thing that we look to do with, with our IT investments is to underwrite or adjust better. So how do you get that information? How do you make that process easier? How do you make it more customer friendly or more agent friendly? And how do you react to changes and react quickly? And then the third thing is that you cost less to operate, right? This is we're running businesses. And a lot of that, um, fortunately, being able to um, cost less to operate can also be how do you actually meet the consumer where they want to be? So the things that Scott just mentioned, electronic payments or electronic documents, self-service, it's all things that people expect now, but it also helps with our operations and how we make that um, a more streamlined and a more cost-effective um, way to do business. So they really do come together. So we can go to the next slide. So as we're looking at the IT budgets and projects, you know, we, we looked at 2020, and 2020 by all accounts was just not a normal year. Um, we looked at it mid-year and there was a pivot that started, especially in the life um, insurance. They started to pivot their dollars more towards the digital experience. And when I say digital, um, there was innovation behind that, right? And carriers were doing things they had never done before. Maybe they talked about them, but they had to do things and they had to do them quickly. So we really saw the biggest shift in 2020 and it's gonna continue in 2021 where digital initiatives are at the top of the list. Um, there was a real need to survive in this business by doing things differently, which became a real driver. So the things that we talked about for many years about um, you know, how do we test and learn how do we do things um, like, like electronic payments or electronic documents? How do we do that? Um, and I think what carriers found was if they didn't have it in place or they had it to a small degree, they realized that they needed to roll it out and roll it out fast. 
um, which is a lot, and, and then learn from it. It didn't mean it would be perfect, but they would learn and they would adjust. And I think in the insurance industry, and, and again, I'm not casting any, any disparaging views on the insurance industry. I, I, am, I am in the insurance industry and I was there for many years. Um, we're cautious and we're risk averse, right? We've heard this for years. And we want things to be perfect and we want our customers to get things perfect. And what we found during this time was we could roll things out and we could learn and we could adjust and our customers were happy and our agents were happy. So just something to think about as we go forward. Um, the other thing that we saw is from the property and casualty side, just to give a little bit of a, um, a, of a contrast, they really haven't changed their priorities because property and casualty is way ahead of life when it comes to digital and, and innovation, right? A lot of it because they had to. And when I mentioned that I was in banking, property and casualty and life, I've really seen the difference. Um, banks really knew from many years ago that they needed to watch from their customers and they had to look at the business from their customer's perspective inside. Um, insurers have had a hard time moving to that um, and to find out how do, I, um, how do I understand what my customer wants and give that to them. But banks had a driver, right? Banks have the driver of being very high transaction volume. There's a lot of interaction. Think of all that you do with your bank. And they realize if we meet the customer where they want to be, it's going to be a better experience. Property and casualty followed pretty quickly behind that, maybe five to 10 years, right? And they started understanding we need to do that well because we've got a lot of transactions. There wasn't as much of an impetus on the life um, industry because we don't have lots of interaction with our customers. There are not transactions every single day, but there really is an opportunity to engage with them more, to engage with them the way they want and to make sure that that's a, um, a seamless experience. So I think that um, the pandemic may have escalated that, right? I think we've all seen that. Um, and, and we've really realized that it's now, it's, it, it, you, can't, you can't avoid it anymore. And there's other courses we'll talk about too. Um, Nancy, you and I have had that conversation, sorry to interrupt, but around yeah. the pandemic really, we've, we've been talking about innovation in all ways and shapes and forms for so long in the life industry. But we, we've really seen a, a switch in, in 2020 where it's kind of like forced our hand so that's how we started coming up with the theme around forced innovation with uh, yeah. what we've seen over this last 2020. So I really yeah. think that's really um, an important point to, to, well, to pay attention to. Survival is a really um, powerful motivator, right? And we really found there was a need. We needed to roll out Zoom to, to agents. They needed to find how to engage their customers without going to their house. Um, we needed to figure out how things could happen without having everybody in the office opening mail and scanning. Um, and, and I think those are things we all knew could be there. And I think the business case is even stronger now. So a couple of other things. I mean, when you talk about portals, um, you know, people are looking to enhance them rather than totally replace them to make sure that they really do meet the customer need. Um, and cloud is something else that um, it's another thing that the pandemic probably put a, a, some light on too is understanding the benefits of the cloud. And I think insurers are really looking at that. And we've got three quarters um, of insurers um, looking to increase their cloud footprint as we go forward. So we can go forward on the slide. So this is just a look at um, kind of the budgets over the past several years. It, it really hasn't changed, right? So as a percentage of premium, it stayed pretty much the same. Um, and we've had some ups and downs in the business during this time, but it stays pretty constant. So obviously, as everybody on this call knows, it's not necessarily um, about the dollars. It's what's the priority and how do you go after the things that are really going to give you some value and really going to deliver for your customers and for your agents. So you can go forward. If you look at, again, digital initiatives, and I'm going to keep equating some digital with innovation because I think it's really an important innovation. So innovation doesn't mean it's brand new. It's something that you're, you're looking at and how do you apply it to your business in a different way? And there's lots of opportunities in the life world. So if you look at this, um, at this, this was, was really um, polling our, um, our research council to see where are they spending their dollars. Digital on the life side, which is that lighter blue, was came back as a top priority for everyone that we talked to. Um, it just it, it kind of just made every other category seem so much smaller. Now, obviously, everything else has to be, um, there's care and feeding that you need to give to everything. You need to make sure that your core application um, is, is working well. And some of these, there's some overlap, right? Because some of the digital initiatives are really talking about the core as well. Um, IT operations, data, these are all things that are important. 
but digital um, and everything that's incorporated into that is really where people are looking. So we can go forward. Okay, so when you look at it from a business perspective, um, and we talk to some business people within, within insurance, they also look at this um, as really important because when you talk about digital and innovation, the distribution and the ease of doing business fits into that category. BI and analytics is another one that they're incredibly um, you know, interested in and really think it needs to be a focus. And a lot of that, especially in the life world, is going to point back to how do we better underwrite um, in, in the world? How do we get additional data? What do we do with that? Um, how do we get customer insights to make sure that we give the customers what they're looking for? So in a world where people aren't leaving their houses in, in some cases, or where they're being very selective about who they let into their home, having somebody come to the door and draw blood is about the last thing they're going to let you do, right? So I think at this point, we've also talked about how do we, how do, we do um, fluidless underwriting going forward? This is going to push us forward. And I think in the carriers that we talked to, the ones that had something to pivot to, um, they had data and analytics, have had a great sales year because they were able to increase the face values that they allowed with fluidless underwriting. They had great data capabilities, but more important than just having the data and the insight, they were able to implement it into their core systems and they were able to do it quickly. So innovation is, is great and having insights and data and knowing what you need to do is not even half the battle. It's the implementation and acting on those insights is really where the rubber hits the road. Because um, if you know things, but you can't implement them, you're not going to get any benefit from them. So those are the kinds of things that we looked at from a business perspective. And when you think of ease of doing business, it's not just for your customers and your agents. You also have to look at your internal employees and how do you make, how do you make their jobs easier? How do you make them able to work remotely? How do you impact the workflows? How do you digitize some of the things that they need? At this point, you know, most people are home working. And, and I think the future is not going to be everybody running back into the office. There's going to be a hybrid model and there's benefits to that, right? There's, there's, you know, there's real estate footprint benefits from that and, and carriers are looking at that. They're also looking at talent benefits from that because they're going to be able to break down the geographic barriers to talent and open, open up the world to lots of people they can have as contributing to their organizations. But if you don't have the backbone and the ability to be able to get the work to them, that's not going to work well. Um, so we can move forward. And we can move forward again. So just to kind of wrap some of this up, right? So there's, um, when we say making the most of a bad experience, I tend to be a glass half full person. So although this year was not what I would choose, I think there's some really important things that came out of it that we can learn and we can take forward. And hopefully we've built that muscle memory to be able to do that. So we had insurers who were grappling with challenges before the pandemic, right? There's been um, bizarrely low interest rates um, and that we all thought were gonna bounce back several times. Um, you know, that's been over 10 years that it's been like that and it hasn't changed. So that's kind of exacerbated all of the, um, the issues that we've had. And understanding that the pandemic has made it kind of added even more challenge. So some of the things that, um, that we hope to get out of this is that you know we're going to accelerate our digitization and visualization of what we do virtualization i'm sorry um, that there's going to be changes in products and there's going to be demands for new ones and we're going to recognize them and address them it's not just that these are the products we've always sold we need to understand that there's different needs um, and then an awareness of the demographic shift because we've got um, you know the numbers over 50 percent of our workforce is our millennials, right? So as somebody who's like bringing up the end of the baby boomers, I know what the baby boomer generation is like. Um, my kids are millennials. I understand that they're different. And then we've got the, the Gen Z. We always forget about Gen X for some reason. We just kind of, we just pass right over because <laughs> they're kind of in the middle. Um, and then, then Gen Z is going to be coming up and they're, they are a totally technology savvy generation. They don't know what a world without technology is. So we've got some real changes coming. Um, but I think what's happened, too, is with the pandemic, where millennials had this need to do things online, to do things without making phone calls, to not be in person, 
that has shifted and the expectations have shifted for other generations as well. I myself do everything online. I mean, I am in technology, but I had resisted in some ways as well. My 93 year old mother um, is a chronic Amazon shopper now. Like that's all she does, right? So there are packages on her, on her um, constantly, but because she learned that, she's also expecting everybody she does business with to be able to meet her where she wants to be. Um, so I think that's really extended beyond the generational barriers and we need to understand that as well. So we can go forward. So the one other thing I wanted to bring up, which is another force that's coming at us, is that AMBEST is looking at innovation. So um, this actually like scared some people to their core, right? Um, but they were looking at it as a rating factor. And what we need to take from that is that AMBEST is looking at this and saying those carriers that know how to innovate and work and, and, and then implement on that innovation are going to be the ones that are successful in the future. They realize that this is really a core piece of how we need to do business. And it's been a lot, it's been hard to move forward. So measuring your innovation is a really hard nebulous thing to do. Um, so it's really kind of a maturity model. And it's looking at, is your leadership supportive of innovation? Is your culture supportive of innovation or does it kill it, right? Because cultures can kill innovation because it's like the antibodies that go after something that's different. Um, do you put resources on it? Do you have the process and structure? Are you measuring results? And what kind of transfer transformation are you actually getting from it? So it's an important thing and, and AMBEST has gone out and they've actually done this and they've got, done kind of a baseline for carriers and shared it with them. Um, but eventually it will be published. So it's not published to everyone yet, but it's something that's coming and we need to be aware of that as an industry. So we can go forward. So some things to just remember, right? So essentially our, our, our function um, is, has not changed, right? As carriers, we need to communicate with our stakeholders and that can take many forms. We need to analyze the risks and the losses and we need to create and maintain contracts. So we've kind of looked at it. Flip that a little bit on its side and what's in that box is you really look at it as you need to strive to become easy to do business with, not just communicate to people. You need to generate the insights from data. And as I mentioned, you have to be able to act on those insights as well. And then you need to be able to bring new products to market quickly. You need to recognize whether or not they're being effective and do you need to change them or tweak them to be more responsive to what your customer needs are. So we need to continually improve capabilities in digital um, as well as analytics and core systems, but you need the ability to implement and act on what you know. So just to wrap it up, the things to remember, customer and workforce demographics, other industries out there like an Amazon where people are, have an expectation of technology, um, the pandemic that just brought that bar up even higher, um, and then AM best. So, um, when we say that it's, it's no longer optional for innovation, I think there's a real business case that's really pushing us. We can go forward. Yeah. So, so just some, some thoughts, um, and hopefully I know we have a lot of questions, but um, some food for thought on there's a lot going on in the industry. Um, you know, there's a lot going on in society as a whole, and we obviously are a big part of that. Thanks, Nancy. That's a great, uh, great lead in to uh, some of the questions and some of the other anecdotes and information that we wanted to try and share uh, on the panel. Um, so maybe we'll start getting into some of the questions that, you know, have kind of come up through your presentation and that, you know, we've kind of thought about leading into this. And I'd probably like to address the first question over to Scott, if that's okay, around being easy to do business with that Nancy talked about in this new world. Um, you know, you, you referenced earlier uh, today that you've already just went live um, with new systems and you know, how, what, what are you guys really doing to help your agents um, do business with you guys, uh, meet, meet their customer demands, you know, virtually in the last eight to 10 months? What have you guys really been able to accomplish? Yeah, I think uh, just from that perspective, I think we've been fortunate enough that we were one of the first insurance companies, life insurance companies to launch an EAP. And we did that many years ago. So we had a pretty long runway um, in terms of trying to convince people, and it was convincing people to try to use it. Uh, adoption rate was really low for the longest period of time. 
Um, and it wasn't until probably last two or three years where we really saw adoption rate going up uh, to the point that, you know, when we onboard a new advisor, how we would train that advisor is they'd be trained on how to use the e-app. We, you know, we, if we had to, we begrudgingly gave them a paper app and said, okay, here's our paper app. Uh, but we were directing people mostly to the e-apps. Um, so from our perspective, we were lucky that way. So we were, when the pandemic hit, um, we were pretty successful with regards to already having a core group of advisors that were already using our EF. Um, and I think it just became a necessity to say that we have nobody in our office. We went 100% work from home. Um, you know, we used to send uh, one person into the mailroom one day a week to try to process any, and it wasn't even focused on, it was focused on checks that we would get to make sure premiums were being paid. Um, so it almost became a necessity. And what we do is focus our attention on, okay, those who aren't using the EF <laughs> or the technology that we have, how do we get them there? Um, but we didn't just focus on the EF, we focused on the full experience. So we have an internal system or a portal, if you want to call it, for our advisors. And we've been very successful with the launch of that because it gives them a status update. It's where they can find out all of their information. It's like their own little portfolio. Uh, we call it Web Kapow. Don't understand the name of it personally, but but it's been very successful. So advisors already knew that, uh, you know, I got to log on, I have a log on, I can go in and see it. So then, you know, for us, it's then training them on not just about how to complete the EF, but how they can have a digital experience with us. Um, and then with respect to with respect to the policy delivery, uh, it's funny because when <laughs> when you showed the slide on IT spend, um, and I agree with that, that we haven't spent a hell of a lot more than what we were originally going to spend on our IT budget. Um, but I just find it funny that I I've been pushing digital delivery of policies for the last three years, and I'd always get back. It's a two year project. It's a million dollars, two million dollars, maybe. And it's interesting your point about perfection, because I think that's what it was. It was about perfection when the pandemic hit. Um, all of a sudden we were delivering our policies electronically uh, within about a month. Um, Again, wasn't perfect. Uh, apparently, we had PDF copies of our policies already. We they weren't pretty. Um, you know, they weren't as fancy as what they wanted to be. And the delivery mechanism wasn't spectacular. But you talk about a minimal viable product. It was exactly what we needed, and people started to use it. And then you attach a DocuSign signature with it, or and uh, and again, it's it was training the advisors on how to do everything digitally, so then they could see the whole journey. So I think for them is understanding the whole journey and. And even if you can get them comfortable with one part of the process, that's the to us, that's the key is getting them comfortable with one part of the process. Then they'll quickly expand to other parts because they know, oh, this isn't so bad. This isn't so scary. So uh, that's how ultimately that's how we were. Uh, we've been successful with that. Um, and then, of course, we just launched a new e app, which is an even more enhanced e app with with Sapiens, which we're hoping. You know, because it's always the question of, all right, once the pandemic is over and we all go back, will people gravitate back towards that? Uh, and our intent is, you know, we're making a pretty significant stance and saying, no, we're not, you know, we still want to be a digital company, a life insurance digital company that operates from a paperless perspective. So, Scott, it was interesting that you mentioned the minimum viable product, because I think that's something that we've had some difficulty in getting people to truly understand. So yeah. hopefully with the type of experience you had, it's something people get, right? We did something, it was not perfect, but yeah. it was really good. It was good Oops. and there's an ability to be able to kind of learn from it and see what you need to do. I think one of the things that we need to get over as an industry is that <clears throat> we strive for perfection, but part of it is because we budget and if mm -hmm. we don't get everything into that very first implementation, we're never gonna go back and do right. anything more. Day, so day two's never happen. <laughs> right, exactly. So I think that's a really important lesson. And the yep. other is to be able to have some kind of flexibility in your applications to be able to make those changes pretty quickly and easily. Yeah, and, and I mean, it opens it up for us anyway. What we found is, you know, it opens it up knowing that it's not perfect. Um, I think the key there to that point is if you're getting feedback, whether it's from your sales teams or even your internal folks or the advisors, is having that ability to make some of those early enhancements, not big, 
not big changes, but just small modifications that they're like, oh, so I was listened to, you know, so they, they took back and it was an easy fix. So we make the fix. And then I think that even buys in, uh, gets the buy-in even more. I mean, I try to equate it to all of the, you know, the apples of the world and stuff. I mean, how much, how many times do they launch something? And then, you know, three or four weeks later, you're getting a new updated version. You get a new updated version because it's just constant updates, right? Because they know that they didn't get it right the first time either. So. Scott, there's a, a question that I'm seeing here in the in the okay. chat. Um, what are you seeing done as far as strategies? This could be for Nancy as well. What are you seeing done as far as strategies employed to increase the usage and adoption of the EAP process? Did you guys uh, so, do anything? Did you guys do anything special? Money talks. Let's. <laughs> you know, there's always. I mean, at the end of the day, for us. Um, because we have a fully integrated e-app, I mean, ultimately it will go from our e-app to our underwriting system, to our uh, policy admin system. Um, you know, we do get efficiencies from that perspective. So if it's an e-app, not everything auto ingest, we have lots of kickouts and reasons why it doesn't auto ingest, but we do get operational efficiencies. So it's, to your point that you made earlier, Nancy, we do save money operationally. Um, so for us, it's, you know, the get people on board and a great example is, you know, with the launch of our new e app, there's a little bit of an incentive there to say, hey, if you use it, you know, maybe we'll give you a little bit of an increase um, for for certain things or or maybe there's different incentives that you can give. I mean, that's without saying, let's face it, you know, sometimes you just got to buy the usage. Um, that's that's without a doubt. Um, and then other is just training a lot of time on training. Uh, we, we spend a lot of time, our sales force now, basically their whole, their whole initiative right now is it's sales, but it's more of a training capacity, how to use our tools. Their conversations are not about premium targets or it's about how to use the tools so that you can write business. So, I mean, we, we haven't come up with any magic bullet yet, but you know, whatever we can. Yeah, I can give you a couple examples of how to, uh, you know, get agents to uh, you know to go to an e-app, and it's and it's real life examples. And one company, what they did was they uh, reduced commission on paper apps, uh, which was you know disincenting them. And uh, another company, what they did was uh, they told the agents that on the on the next January first they were going to entirely e-applications. So for that year, what they told the agents was, we want you to transition over to e-apps. And the way they did it was they told the agents um, that if you submit a paper app, it's not going to account for your bonus or your your incentive, you know, whatever you whatever was the trip or anything for the year. And you know that got their attention really quick. And you know, they had a couple old timers that you know were adamant about, you know, I, I want to use paper and blah blah blah. But all of a sudden, when you told them, well, okay, well you're not going to, it's not going to count for your bonus, and you're not going to make the trip next year. Well, all of a sudden, hey, I'm going to use an e app. So. Yeah, they, exactly. not only do you, can you incent them, but can disincent them also. And you know, and there's a lot of and a lot of it's training. I mean, you uh, you know, when you go to an e app, you know, NIGO disappears. And you know, if you train you say, listen, we're never going to have to come back to you to say hey, you forgot this on the application, or you forgot the relationship with the venue, or whatever. And also, you know, to train them that hey, you know, when a paper app comes in, we've got a lot of extra work to do. Uh, and if an e app comes in, and if you're if you got the right system, it goes right into the system. The underwriter sees it right away, uh, and and your, your cycle time goes down. So there's a lot of pluses to it. And I think it's, you know, I've heard some companies say, well, you know, if, if we go to a e app, you know, we're going to lose business because our competitor isn't doing it. Well, you know, the thing is, you know, everyone's going to be an e app eventually. And you know, I've always said, if you treat your agents properly, if you have good product, good service, you're not going to lose them. I mean, they'll stay with you. Yeah. I mean, absolutely, and that's the thing. It's the full to us, and and the point that you made, uh, John, is that if NIGOs go down, and I mean, we've ha we've had instances where, um, you know, because it qualified for our non mid limits, it came in, it automatically ingested into our system. They answered all of the medical questions that we asked without any problems, and we have auto issues. So literally, the whether they're on the phone or meeting face to face, they got a notification that the policy was approved, and here's a copy of it. Right. So, I mean, the, sure. I think if they start to realize, oh, well, that was easy. Right. So it's well, that know, was efficient. So it looks good yeah, for the them. Thing is, in front of the client. Yeah. The funny thing is, too, is I think it's 
it depends on the distribution. Now, I think PNC agents, uh, you know, they've been doing non-paper for years. I, I, I don't remember the last time, yeah. you know, I've been around for a long time and I bought a lot of houses and bought a lot of cars. I don't remember the last time that I had to fill out a piece of paper to get my auto or homeowner's insurance. And in fact, I don't remember the last time, I, I remember the last time I met my agent face to face. And it was back when I, just after I got out of college, uh, my mom worked at Sears and my agent was at that time, all state had agents in Sears stores. And I went to pick up my mom and she said, we go talk to this guy, get your car insured. And that was the last time I actually saw a PNC agent in person. Uh, and I don't think I've ever filled out any paper. I mean, it's, they're like I think you mentioned, like they're way ahead of us of the life, yeah. life industry. They they are way ahead, and and that's a perfect example. But the last time I saw my agent was in the grocery store. It had nothing to do with yeah. any kind of business. Well, I, well, I wouldn't so, even recognize my agent. Yeah. I've never seen him. So. <laughs> but um, but I think when you talk about getting um, adoption, I think obviously when you're impacting someone's um, income. That's a that's a motivator. Right. Um, the other is cycle time means you get paid faster, right? So that's still right. hitting them there without really changing any of your compensation structure. Right. Um, but the other is, I know some some um, different companies have looked at you know different ways of of implementing change, and one is getting one of your biggest detractors, and getting that detractor to be um, accepting of it and working with them really closely. And there's lots of incentives you can give. The other is starting to work with some of the younger agent population. Again, not disparaging more senior people because I'm in that <clears throat> other generation as well. Um, but there's, there, there is just a natural need. In fact, a lot of the, the um, younger agents are really looking for change and really looking for ways to make this better because they know that it can be. Um, and what happens is as they're doing it and they're being more productive, people notice and they understand it and they want to understand how they can be just as productive. So yeah. there's lots I of one, sense. You know, another big thing too is your EF process has, has to be simple and intuitive mm -hmm. uh, so that anybody can go in there and without, without even training, just figure it out. I mean, and most, most ones I've seen are like that, but but some agents just get kind of like, I don't know how to do this. And once they, and you know, my experience was once they got in and did it a couple of times, it was, well, well it's easy. You know, why, why haven't, why didn't I do this before kind of thing, you know? Yeah, well, that's good. That's becoming even more important because as each carrier launches, of course, and that's where you get the disjointed nature of life insurance too. Every, every carrier has its own e-app. Uh, so if you have multiple advisors, you know, who are comparing it against markets or they may use your e-app depending on how busy they are, maybe your e-app once a month, you know, but then they're also using two or three other different e-apps. So you're absolutely very, if you can, if you can make your e-app simple enough, they will gravitate to, the, to your e-app because if it's easier to do than your competitors, then, you know, they will not necessarily say that they, they will sell your product when they shouldn't, but they would gravitate and probably push your product a little bit more because it's easier for them to deal with, for sure. Well, and I think companies have to think in, a, in the future too, because you know a lot of this may end up eliminating the agent in the sales process, especially for smaller base amounts. Yeah. Uh, so you have to something that simple that uh, that a customer can go into your website or wherever and do any application and not stumble over things and not understand how to do it. It's got to be very intuitive for somebody to fill it out. Absolutely. Yeah, John, I, I, I actually believe that it should be, it sh a customer should be able to do it. Mm -hmm. um, the only the, the only thing where I, my opinion differs a little bit is that I don't think the agent is gone, um, but I think there's going to be a lot of room for assisted sales, right, where people want to take it to a certain point and then get referred to an agent. I still think it's a complicated thing. Even simple products can be somewhat complicated. And people are talking about a safety net or potentially a lot of money. Um, and there's still, I think there's still a need for a relationship. Um, there may be some people that want to do it. I personally have been in the business for my whole life and I would not want to buy a life insurance policy without looking in somebody's eyes, um, even if it's through Zoom. But, um, but I think the, that your point is well taken that it should be easy enough that it could go to, a, to the consumer. They could fill out everything that they need and maybe follow it up with questions or you know whatever the license um, needs are in order to issue the policy. But again, that just flips it back to what I was talking about before is it should be from the consumer's eyes, always. Always right. from the consumer's eyes, and it's gonna be simple. Well, another big key piece from the consumer's eyes too, I think is the ability to buy a life insurance policy without the need to accept 
Why don't we pivot over to that fine topic? I know we've only got a couple yeah. minutes left, but <laughs> <laughs> that's a hot topic. What do you what uh, What's your take then, Nancy, on on the ability to um, to, to to do the acquisition process, the customer acquisition process, without the need to accept fluid or need fluids to underwrite? Um, well, well, companies are doing it, right? So it is being okay. done, yeah. um, and there's sometimes being and and again, there's times when they're kind of changing it as they go, understanding and, and, and kind of measuring the results that they get, kind of comparing it against what they would have accepted based on fluids. And so there's a lot that you can get as you start to do this. And you need to be able to either, you know, accelerate or decelerate um, based on what, on what you're getting. But I think the expectation, if, if in today's world, I don't want to give fluids, once the world is back to whatever the normal is going to be, people are going to line up to, to be stuck with a needle, right? So I, I think from a carrier's perspective, we need to look at what are our alternatives. There's so much more data now than there was before. Um, I mean, if you go back, we used to we used to issue life insurance without fluids, right? That, then it became the norm. And I think we're looking at it to say, what else should we be looking at? What are the other indicators? What other data is out there? Um, and there's some real, um, there's some concerns out there, right? From a regulatory perspective as to, what our carrier is going to start using yeah. and how do you what is ethical and what's not ethical where is that line and it's a very difficult line but i think as we start to get more into the data analytics and understanding trends i think we're going to be doing more and more of it not less um and i think we're going to obviously need to um to be able to explain why we're using data the way that we're using it so there has to be a, a, a good reasonable explanation for it there needs to be some um some facts behind it but we also need to figure out how to be fair as well yeah, um, and not discriminatory yeah. and that's going to be a yeah. challenge and i, I agree with i agree with what you just said about you know the uh you know the information because one of the things as as an underwriter that that I had a problem with was I could always, when I get a blood test and when I get medical records and when I get an exam with blood pressure and I rate the person, I can explain that to them. Hey, your, your kidney functions are off, you're, you're overweight, your blood pressure is high. Uh, but now you start getting into these, uh, these other areas of predictive analytics and things. And I can't explain it to somebody, and I can't explain it to the agent. I can't explain it to the client, and I can't explain it to the client's doctor. Uh, you know, there are there are things out there like the, the lab scores, and you could have a, all your labs could be normal, but you get downgraded because they're abnormally normal, and that is very difficult to explain to a client. Like, hey, you know, everything on my I got my results, everything's normal. How do I? Why are you up? You know, downgrading me. And then you, they go to their doctor and their doctor says, hey, you know, it's all normal. Why are you downgrading my, my patient? Uh, so, yeah, that's what concern I always have about this is that can you explain to somebody when you get this data, you know, what, what it is in that data that's causing you to be downgraded from or, or declined even, you know. But I think there's a, there's, there needs to be a change in the industry from a certain uh, perspective because it, it, we talked about customer with the app customer experience. I think it's, some of it will become a choice, right? Some of it should be, hey, if you don't want to provide fluids, and obviously, you know, we've changed our non med age and amount limits during COVID. You know, we're at age 50, 750,000 requires. Now we've up, you know, we've enhanced our questions. Uh, we do telecues, you know, if required, we'll get a APS. But I think there's the other element where some of it, and right now we kind of do black and white, which is you're either non-med and therefore you get a standard rate, or you do meds and you might get a preferred rate or an elite rate or even rated to a certain extent. Um, but I think, you know, there's nobody, I don't think nobody really has asked, hey, would you like to do medical? Because if you do a medical, you may, you may actually qualify for a better rate. Nobody really asks whether you want or whether you don't want. It's either if you're in this non-med category, that's why you, you know, and then the outcome may be, hey, well, if you answer yes to a question, you got to give the meds. Oh, yeah. but, but we don't really yeah. give the customer a choice. So I think there's an element where you're going to see a a divergence. Yeah, but, so, yeah, but sometimes choose. though, yeah. you know, the concern with giving them a choice is then they are the anti-selecting against you. Well, no, gee, I know my blood's abnormal. I don't want to get a blood, so I, I'm going to do the non-medway. But, you know, another thing that is kind of interesting is like, you know, when you compare us to the PNC side, when you, when you get your, your auto or homeowners, 
they don't tell you you're rated or you're table four no. or you're preferred. They tell you your agent says you owe us forty seven dollars and sixty one cents a month. Yep. Uh, on the life side, you know we're we've got you know twenty five different rate classes that we put people in, and we tell them what that is. And part of it is that we have to because they're you know at least in the U.S. we have regulations with adverse you know decisions and things like that. But you know it would be nice to get to a point where now, if you're just using data, you just say, hey, you know, your your cost for this insurance is $50 it's, a month. It's no and difference from a bank. You don't know if you're you're super referred or whatever. All you know is this is what I got to write a check for every month. Exactly. It's no different than a bank who, you know, certain clients can get prime. Certain clients have to pay prime right. plus four. It's risk rate. Right. It's risk based. You don't know why you got that rate. You just told that that's your rate. So I absolutely agree. I think I think. I think we give the customer from that perspective way too much information that actually makes our product even more confusing. Right? So we talk about how confusing our product can be is plus, you know, that. Right? Yeah, plus we have, you know, we have all these preferred rates and everybody expects to get the best rate and Correct. a small percentage <laughs> do, so you got a large percentage of people are going to complain cuz I didn't get the best rate. Exactly. No, you're absolutely right. And, and I think that's going to be a challenge, right? So regulators are looking at this as well, right? And trying to understand. And, and I think some of the things that from a regulatory standpoint, there's still some struggle is on the one hand, we're hearing AM Best say, you have to be innovative. You have to do things differently. You have to, in order to move this industry forward. And the regulators are on the other side saying, um, let's be slow about this. Let's make sure that nothing you do is going to adversely impact my constituents, all of, which, you know, they're, they're both good forces. Somewhere in the middle is where the carriers are, need to, to figure out what they can do. And they need to be, that's why I was saying, they need to be able to explain it. So understanding the data and having the facts behind your analysis is going to be really important because regulators are going to come in and say, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. um, but the regulators are looking at what are the innovations we need to allow? How do we make sure that we allow innovation in this industry? Because they do know that innovation is going to benefit the customer as well. So there's a fine line and there's some balance. And I think there's going to be a lot of activity um, as carriers come up with new things that they're going to do and regulators look at it to understand it better and figure out what they're going to allow and what they're not going to allow. And we, and, but the one thing is for sure, we know that every state will have something different, right? <laughs> so right. What they'll allow. Um, but it's, it's, it's kind of the challenge of the, of the business. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's another thing that's going to be an evolution. And I think if we, you know, five years from now, if we get together again, we're going to see some real, some real changes. For sure. We always have to be aware too, because what happens generally is when one state finds something they don't like, it tends to spread, you know. <laughs> so you know we are more we don't like, we don't like insurance companies doing this. The other states hear about it and all of a sudden they jump on the bandwagon. So you yeah. so like I said, you always have to be careful of what you're doing because be aware of that. Right. So, but it, it really points back to that's where you need to make sure that within your organization and within your applications, you're flexible enough to react to that. Right. So, right. how do you make sure that you can make those changes when you need to? How do you make sure that your implementations are going to be smooth? And if you need to pull back on something, that can be done um, as well. So, I mean, I grew up in the old days of a COBOL um, program where you had to go out and change it in about 50 or 60 different places, and there was always one we missed. Right. Today, there we do have those um, opportunities to be more agile, and I think we need to take advantage of it. And Scott, were you able to do that over the last few months with the changes that were required to rapidly pivot? Maybe, uh, you know, as you said, you changed your agent amount your rules pretty quickly. Were you guys able to, to change your rules, update your rules? And uh, yeah, I would say, you know, we were we were lucky enough that we could change a fair bit, um, but there are also elements where we created workarounds. Um, yeah. You know, there are, well, we, I just mentioned that we changed our non-med limits. Um, there was, you know, in order, we, we changed pieces of it in certain systems, but then there's other, you know, that to change it where everywhere where it needs to go, no. So, you know, some of the onus we put on our underwriters to make sure that they had to look at the file. So it increased touch, you know, for, you know, every department gets impacted differently. So in, in this case, you know, our, our underwriters were impacted a little bit more because we had to make sure that if it now qualified, because normally it wouldn't, then they would make a note on the file and push it through. Um, but I mean, there were certain changes absolutely that we were able to make. And, and it depends on the system that it was touching because of course our policy and system is a good old fashioned legacy system that, you know, takes forever to try to change versus some of our front end systems are a little bit more up to date from a technology perspective. And therefore, you know, it's easier to make those changes on the fly. Great. 
Well, we're hitting about the top of the hour. We were uh, actually 10 minutes over our scheduled time as of right now. So um, <laughs> is there any closing comments? I'll open it up to anybody who wants to. Uh, Nancy, you've got anything to close with? No, I just, I, I think it's going to be an interesting um, ride for the next um, at least five years. It'll be interesting to see how we can arise to the challenge of innovation because it's coming at us from all different directions. Mm -hmm. um, so um, maybe we can meet again next year to talk about it a little bit more because I think there will be some progress. For sure. You know, I, exciting. Yeah, for sure. Well, John, Scott, Nancy, thank you so much for spending your lunch here with, uh, with us. Um, it's a great, great conversation. Um, we'll, we'll definitely earmark this for next year again and see what's been updated. And I look forward to talking to you all soon. And I hope everyone has a wonderful holiday season. All right. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks, everyone. Okay, okay. Bye bye. Bye bye.